Alright guys, it's Chris with Drop Dice, so we're back again with Endeavor. Um, this time we're going to be doing the Sector Map. Um, so, I first off, you know, I've, I've got a lot of positive response about Endeavor, and I am still looking for players, so if you are interested, it's the recruitment is being done through the Tabletop RPG One-Shot group on Facebook. Uh, I haven't decided on which players are going to be playing just yet, but I do want to give it some time so that people can decide if they want to play or not. Uh, so that post will be up for the rest of today at least, and um, I should be making a decision within the next day or so, um, if not later tonight, um, being Monday the 30th, in case you are watching this at a different time. Now, what I wanted to do was go ahead and jump over to another scene, but I wanted to, I wanted to take a moment again to, to thank my friend Nelson at Infinite Roleplay because he saw the last video and saw one of the complaints I had about some of the character generation, or excuse me, sector generation stuff about not having fillable forms. Well, he turned around and created a fillable PDF. Now, I'm going to use it a little bit differently than how he built it, but I loved the idea of it. So, right here in my Roll20, I've uploaded it, and I've got a little star that I went ahead and plopped down. Um, and as we go through this, I'm actually going to update this and uh, get this all caught up. Now, because of the way roll 20 is let me move some stuff around real quick here I'm gonna shift my camera position to right here there we go and that way you can see everybody can see the map as I'm editing it here um, so I went ahead and plopped down one star just so I can get myself a start here but all I need to do is copy and paste that and then I can slap it down anywhere I want um, but I also have these fillable boxes that we can take advantage of to write down uh, the planet names. So this would be my sector, which um, for now is going to be an unnamed sector. And now the cool thing is, is with roll, roll 20, we can turn around and plop in some font. Let's do 26 right here and put unnamed sector just for now. So 26 seems to be a pretty decent sized font. Uh, let me... Move that around here real quick. Unnamed sector. All right, cool. So with stars without numbers, the grid that you use is a hex space grid first off. And it is going to be, let me just double check it real quick here. Mm -mm -mm. A hex grid of 10 hexes high and 8 wide, which ha this happens to be perfect for. Uh, because I'm willing to bet that Nelson had this in mind when he built it originally. So it works out great for me. Now, we're going to use a little bit of random generation inside the book, but we're also going to use a little thought as part of our process here. Now, once you have the map sheet, it tells you to roll a d10 and add 20 to determine the total number of stars in the sector. So let me do this real quick here. We're going to actually show all the dice rolls just to make it easy. So if you've never seen Roll20 in action, you can actually see how to put down any of this stuff here. It's going to be slash R for roll, and then uh, 1d10 plus 20. And then I just realized that my picture is in the way anyways. So forgive me for that one. Um, let's see here. So we're going to have 27 stars inside the system. Let's, uh, let's try this instead. Rip. I'm going to move up to the top here instead. There we go, 27 stars inside the system, and that'll work out just fine for me. Now, once I've determined the total number of stars, I will then go ahead and uh, it says, for the first 20 or so stars, roll a D8 and a D10 together to determine the column and row in which the star, to place the star. So, slash, or slash roll, 1D8 slash roll 1d10 and I should break them apart never mind it does not and 1d10 so 4 and 8 so remember your 8 across is at the top there and then your 10 is down so 4 across plus 8 down which would be 4,008. There is my first star. Easy enough. And then we do the same thing. Oops. There we 
go. So I rolled two sets here real quick just to get it out of the way. I'm actually going to switch over to dice because the uh, the roller is just taking a while here. And frankly, it'll be easier for me to work directly with dice. And for the most part, a lot of times rollers, that is the case. It is easier to work with dice directly. So screw the roller. We'll just do this the old-fashioned way. So let's go ahead and plop down a new star. And this one is going to go to uh, 3,000. And five, so right here. Okay, and this one will be zero one, which should be right here. Next one will be. 3,005, which is a duplicate, so let's roll something else. 7,000, it looks like, for the next one. That's four. You get the basic idea here, but just kind of bear with me. I'm going to pause this for a second, and then we'll come right back after I finish uh, setting these up here. So uh, just hang tight. We'll be right back. All right, so we're back here. Um, so I finished filling in the, the sector here and gave everything its placement. Now, I made some interesting choices, or at least what I think would be our interesting choices. So I talked about it before. A drill is basically moving a hex inside the game. Like, uh, for example, in the, in the game Swan Song, the Swan Song at the beginning of the, the adventure has a... Uh, fuel capability of two and a drill of one, which means for each fuel they spend, they can go one hex. So, like, for example, they could go from 6,003 to 6,004 to 5,004 um, to to do their one drill or one drill's worth of, of fuel to get to 6,004, one drill's worth of fuel to get to 5,004. Because the ship is going to start off with a smaller drill space, I thought it would be interesting to punch my dog in the face. Hold on a second. All right, I'm back. I was just kidding about punching my dog in the face. But anyways, so with this sector map, what I've essentially done is I made some choices that I thought were interesting because the way drill technology works is the highest amount of drill that you ever really see are ones and twos on most uh, regular ships. However, like bigger merchant ships, they do have things that are like higher as, as, as of having uh, drills of like four five and six so i put a star that was a little bit out of the way over here at uh, 0009 um it's actually no matter how many no matter where you start it's oops not the case hold on a second let me move that one over here so no matter where you start you have four hexes that you have to go to get to it uh, which means that you either need a drill of two with fuel of two or a drill of four with fuel of one or basically anything that will add up to make it, making it four hexes of travel. So this planet will actually be quite secluded and I thought that would be interesting to have kind of a um, a planet that, that isn't easily accessible, that maybe there's some stories about, you know, what kind of super awesome rare item comes from there. So... I've kept my sector unnamed inside here. I'm actually going to list the names of every planet. Like, for example, uh, let's do one real quick here, which we will do text and keep it 26 for the font size. And the first one that comes up is actually going to be 0001. And let's call that Cygnus Prime. And... Let's do that, move it over here, that way it lines up everything. And now I've got the planet named. What I would do then is go into my journal and make a handout for that planet. Uh, actually, not a handout, let me change that real quick here. I'll delete that hang handout. Because I can create a new folder, I'll just create a new one and I'm gonna call it, uh, sector map. Uh, key. Actually, just sector map will be fine. So now I've got the sector map, and I can turn around and I can add a handout underneath that. And now I can edit this to say zero 01, 
Cygnus Prime and then I will select it for all player journals and because I like my players interacting I'm going to say that all players can edit this of course and I'm gonna tag it as a planet which will be good for finding things later on or not a, as a planet rather but as a star and if I had a image for the star itself beyond just this little token image that I put down I could put it inside here um, it'll be more important for uh, for planets and so I can put inside here big star Wow or something ridiculous like that and then I can put secret GM note about star radiation or something ridiculous along those lines um, save it inside there and I've got it here in fact I'm a pretty obsessive person as far as that goes so what I may end up doing is actually creating a subfolder and let's call this subfolder uh, Cygnus Prime which means that that is the star and then underneath Cygnus Prime I can put the handout for the planet that is underneath there oops not show to players and let's say that this planet just has a name and it's AZ 179 AZ 179 I can put inside here as that and then we'll get back to planet creation here in a minute but I just wanted to show you some options if you decide to take advantage of um, roll 20 how you can organize things and make it a very useful tool for you because I've heard a lot of complaints about Roll20. I use it pretty regularly and I've had no real issues with it. Um, the recording software previously used to be a little bit sketchy. Uh, it's gotten a lot better since then as far as uh, the cameras inside game and all that stuff. Um, but I don't typically use that. Instead I use like Google Hangouts and then we use Roll20 for the organization of the game. But there is an idea of how the the planets and the map will come out. I'm going to go ahead and pause it again real quick here, and I will uh, get back with you guys in just a second after I've labeled all my stars. All right. And, uh... All right, so we're back. I went ahead and filled in all the stars and my uh, chart here, which I had to double up my chart, so as you can tell, I kind of... I did a layered copy and then put another one in the background just so I could have two charts next to each other. The other thing I did is I updated my journal so that I have this uh, the sector Asgard Theta as I'm I've named it here. I've got all my planet names and their locations inside the key here but I also have it broken down over here so that I can input my planets just like we t mentioned earlier. Um, what I'm gonna do now is go ahead and pull up the information on how to randomly generate a world let me real quick here which is actually just a couple quick rolls and then we will create our first world which will be in the Cygnus planet or Cygnus star rather so add a handout which let's go ahead and edit here all right, so we're going to roll 2d6. It's, we're going to determine the atmosphere, which is 2d6, and then we'll consult the table. If you have any questions about the book, it is actually, I have the core edition. There is also a free edition. I decided to spring for the core because I wanted to support the writer. Uh, but the page that I am on is uh, 87 of the core, if you want to follow along. So for atmosphere, let's see here. I got a six, which is breathable mix. So let's go ahead and type that up here. Atmosphere. Breathable mix. All right, so let's go ahead and go down to the definition here. Breathable mix can support human life without additional equipment. Uh, gene, or gene engineering modification uh, any world that has human population in the millions or more or almost certainly has a breathable mix atmosphere while the air is breathable almost every world has its own subtle cocktail of inert gases atmospheric contaminants and other o odiferous ingredients for spacers accustomed to filtered air of the starship the new world stink of fresh planet air can be maddening 
as few linger long enough to get used to the smells of the local air, attempting to explain the source of discomfort to the locals rarely results in positive results. Some spaceport bars make a point of their air filtration uh, in composition mixers. So there's kind of a, an idea there. There's also some different atmospheres. Unfortunately, I got one of the generic ones for our first roll here, but that's fine. The next thing that we're going to roll for is the temperature, which they use kind of a, uh, a generic temperature setting here. Um, the world's average temperature de depends largely on part of its by its atmosphere, and it goes into longer details from that. Again, it's going to be 2d6, and this time I got a 3, which is going to be uh, variable cold to temperate. Let me go ahead and write that down here. Which variable cold to temperate, let's pull up that one real quick here. Mm -mm. Variable temperatures show greater distribution of climates than other worlds, either ranging from cold to temperate levels or temperate to hot. This may be climate changes worldwide uh, that changes worldwide when a long or slow orbit drift brings the planet into proximity with stellar prox or stellar primary. Uh, which I like. That's kind of an idea of instead of just a, a circular, you have kind of more of an oblong. Uh, kind of rotation around the star, which would actually explain why it goes from cold to temperate, which is actually kind of cool. Uh, and then you can look at cold worlds, which are uncomfortable, but humans can survive on them with nothing with in nothing more than heavy clothing. There's also frozen worlds, which are much more worse. Think like Hoth. And then temperate worlds are most populated uh, colony sites. They generally are very easy to get along with. So maybe this world is is cold when it's on the outer edges of its of its um, rotation, and then when it gets a little bit closer, it becomes a very fertile planet, which is kind of fun and interesting to play up because during the time of year, we can actually play with that. Now, time of year is actually based on the Gregorian calendar, um, which we'll get into more as we move along. So the next thing we look at is the biosphere, which um, some some planets are uh, unlikely to have biosphere, uh, an airless rock frozen wasteland, or boiling thin, or world of boiling tin are all unlikely to host supportable microbes. And then it goes on to talk about whether or not it the biosphere uh, is edible, colonists on the world could be supported, grow Terran crops, that sort of thing. So let's take a look at what the biosphere would be for this one. which will actually give us an idea of what we can do with the planet as well. So for my biosphere role, I got six, which is uh, human miscable biosphere, which is those in which some substantial portion of native life is biologically compatible with human nutritional needs. Local plants and animals may not be very tasty or terribly nourishing, but they can support life without serious uh, importation of Terran crop seeds and livestock. Uh, the friendlier human miscible biospheres often lack a wide variety of, of edibles that evolved on Earth, and natives often supplement their own stock of local foods with limited Terran agriculture. Exotic foods, spices, and liquor can be found on in stellar transportation to feed the hungry for novelty on the worlds. Unfortunately, the fact that humans can eat some native life means that they're very likely to ha that some native life can eat humans in turn. Large predators, disease capable of human infestation, are no means uncommon on these worlds. Small colonies can be hard-pressed to survive on them. So that gives me an idea of, of what this is. So let me write that down. Human miscable. Biosphere. All right, cool. There again, the chart has lots of different options, which I'll go through and create at least one planet for each star, because that's their recommendation. So I should have at least 20, 27, because that's the stars that I rolled. Uh, the other thing I added to this chart was the ship, so that when my players wanted to move the ship around, they could say, "Oh, we're gonna go to this square, this square, that square," and it lets them move around the map. The rest of the map is static, and they can't modify that unless they go into the map layer, which I'm the only one that has the ability to do that. So easy enough. All right, so let's take a look here. Population. This one is, again, another 2d6. So I got a 7 this time. Hundreds of thousands of inhabitants, 
which mm, mm, hundreds of thousands make up populations most frontier worlds usually the ones with adequate supplies and land and service conditions to humans without a vac suit or filter mask which actually lines up pretty good with what we were talking about so population hundreds of thousands which I can actually um, narrow down as as time goes on of inhabitants like I want to say there's hundred and twenty five thousand or something like that I can come up with that number but this is kind of broad strokes to get me started Mm -mm -mm. let's see and tech level so this is the interesting part the tech levels are kinda cool um, let's talk about them for a second before I fill this in so tech level 0 is stone age technology level 1 is medieval technology level 2 is 19th century 3 is 20th century 4 is baseline post tech which is um, basically the ability to travel between stars and what general sci-fi of stars without numbers is tech level 5 is with specialities or some surviving pre-tech which means that um, some of the stuff before the screen like the advanced technology healing arts um, maybe some better engines exist there and then level five is pre-tech uh, pre-silence technology which means that you're gonna have some just out of control awesome technology available on that planet and maybe it's not a hundred percent all over the place but it is there on the planet for people to be able to to get control of uh, let's take a look and see what I ended up with let's see here I got a nine which is tech level four which is baseline so that is a pretty average planet all around here level four if I can type here don't mind me the next big a bit here is assigning world tags the final step in world creation perhaps the most important lies in assigning tags to the world the tags are a brief conceptual tr conception of tropes that set the world off from planets otherwise similar in population and characteristics you can either pick for on the tag table or you can or else you can roll 1d6 and 1d10 to select randomly so let's see here so basically the chart is broken down into six major categories and then there's ten subcategories within that. So let's go ahead and do world tags here. And I need a D10 out. So my first one is going to be a two, which will put me in that second category. And then I got a six, which is going to be freak geology. That's kind of cool. Maybe there's some strange geomorphic um, conditions on the planet. Okay. And let's go ahead and let's see here. You should pick or roll two tags for any given world. Using a single tag can leave the planet feeling somewhat flat and one-dimensional, while using three tags or more can end up muddy and make, uh, muddying the feel of the planet. Okay, so let's go ahead and do a second one here, which is going to be a six and a nine, which is six category, ninth option, which is xenophobes. These people are not friendly towards uh, alien life which is definitely cool. Uh, I just noticed that there is an option for zombies on here. That's kind of cool to be able to do that. Uh, and then from there, we can select cultural flavor, uh, which kind of goes into more details, picking out local language, determining government, uh, address, the spa address the spaceport, which is um, to basically uh, address the fact that it has a spaceport inside it. And then from there, you also get to name the planet. And that's kind of the breakdown of it. And then it gives you some examples here of um, like an abandoned colony, who the enemies and friends, complications, things like that. That that starts on page 97 to give you kind of an idea of of some, some world that you could generate um, with some different points inside there. And that might be kind of a cool thing to kind of pursue here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and pause the video again. 
Uh, and when we come back, I will finish up the entry for this planet at least, and then I will go into making more planets to come up with their random stats here. All right, and we will see you guys in just a minute. All right, so we're back. Um, I've got Cygnus Prime here written up, and I just want to show you how I did my entry real quick here because um, we started talking about what each part was, but I wanted to kind of go into more detail. So I, I misspoke earlier. The stuff starting on page 97 is actually the tags in full detail. So what I did is I put the tags inside the GM section so I had those handy and I didn't have to dig through the book. I also made some bold stuff and some italics just so it was easier for me to read, but... So we've got our basic conditions right here so players understand that. And then the spaceport I called Strix because I decided to go with a Roman cultural theme. Uh, languages of the planet are going to be Latin and English. And uh, the government is the Imperial Line of Tiberius. Current ruler is Marcus Tiberius. And he has a democratic council that advises him. Uh, it is based upon the idea of like a Roman Empire kind of themed planet. Um, and the spaceport is called Strix. It's a vastly wealthy spaceport with a strong imperial presence. The air smells of freshly grilled meats and breads. It also functions as the planet's largest trade city. While the planet has a tech level 4, they do things in a very traditional fashion, cooking their meat rather than using processors, heating their homes with fire, and more often than using the temperature controls in houses. Just to kind of give you an idea of the players, uh, what they should expect on this planet, like there's going to be the technology, they'll be able to buy laser weapons and stuff like that, but for the most part... It's going to have a very traditional feel to the way that the buildings are structured and things like that, at least especially in Strix. Now, if they go to other cities, some of the other cities may be more embracing of the uh, the tech the tech level four that's available to them. Um, like there's probably going to be, since it's a, a tech level four planet, there's probably going to be like an industrial city where it's going to be like any other tech level four planet. But I thought that maybe having the spaceport be lavish and kind of show wealth. that was very kind of uh, Roman empire kind of feeling. So the sites is the gladiatorial arena Thetis, the Golden Ox Tavern, the Wayfarer's Inn, which is a traditional hotel, um, much like you would see on a lower tech level planet. It has a fireplace and uh, heating through conventional methods. And then there's also the Exchange Capsule Hotel, which I listed it here, but I wanted it to be known to my players. Essentially, the Exchange is a internet interstellar banking slash mail slash... Um, they they get their hands in a lot of pots, but they have what's called the capsule hotel service. But basically, every every planet will have these, and they're basically um, coffin beds, kind of similar to the capsule hotels that are out there in Japan. So uh, going into my GM notes, I also have the freak geology. The geology of this world is simply freakish. Perhaps it's entirely composed of mountainous ranges, regular re or regular bands of sea and land. Mineral structures all fragmented into perfect cubes. Locals have learned to deal with it, and their culture is shaped by it. So I haven't decided exactly what it's going to be, but I think when I decide, I'm going to put that inside the details for the players. But it gives me an idea of different adventure seeds that I can do. So, like, it tells me about enemies, friends, complications, things, and places. Same thing with the xenophobes. And what I really liked about the xenophobes was one of these complications here is the natives are symptomless carriers of a contagion and dangerous disease. Um, that seems like a really cool adventure. Maybe there's a guy who's trying to get off planet because, you know, he's he's looking for help from an outworlder, and, uh, you know, that happens to be your crew, and he's paying you to get off planet. But what you don't realize is you're actually carrying a guy who has a contagious and dangerous disease that could spread to other worlds. Perhaps his planet should have been quarantined. They just ha don't know it because they don't get a lot of traffic there and everything. Um... Which I also think is kind of funny because Strix I'm going to have is kind of this welcoming trade city, but the rest of the planet I'm going to really play up that xenophobe feel. Like maybe Strix is where you're authorized to be, and maybe that's going to be an imperial mandate um, that once they get to the planet they're they're told that they are free to walk about Strix, but they are not allowed to move about move about the rest of the planet. Um, and maybe that'll be a complication for one of their adventures on the planet. But that's basically how you put together a planet. Um, and like I said, I'm going to put together uh, 27 of these at least. Um, maybe a little bit more for each section. The other thing I wanted to show you guys real quick here is... Um, so so this is my sector map, the, the universe, which I'm going to rename this real quick here as Sector Asgard... 
theta. Which, in case you're curious how I got some of these names, I actually used the generator to pull up some just basic overviews. And I kept running different uh, generators and finding names that I liked. And then um, I kind of moved on from there. So this is kind of how the layout of the Roll20 is currently set. Um, to kind of give you an idea. And if you ever want to move your players between maps, you can just pick up this bookmark and move them around. So you can actually be on a separate map from your players. Um, so that's basically how the mapping is going to go. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pause it here because I'm going to set up to build a faction real quick just so that I can have an example of that inside the video as well. So stick around and we'll go over the, uh, the factions next. All right, guys, so I'm back. Um, I want to show you this real quick. This is going to be a spreadsheet that I'm going to use that somebody put together uh, on the Internet using that complete resources Reddit that I showed you, um, which is the faction sheet for Google Drive here. Um, unfortunately, uh, factions are a lot more complicated than I was giving them credit for, so I am going to build factions and the rest of the universe offline. I just wanted to kind of show that to you guys that uh, that's that's basically what I'm working with here, um, which again comes from the it me JP in the long run here, the faction sheet. Um, which let's go ahead and take a look at the swan song faction sheet just to get an idea of what a filled in version looks like. So. This is the assets that are available. So this is kind of more for reference. Here is the faction tracker. Uh, let's see here. So the faction tracker, we have like the Andonian Cultural Protectorate, and it talks about what the force is, um, cunning wealth and everything like that, and it talks about what it is. It's the planetary government, and the world is Andoni. Uh, they don't have a goal at the moment. Um and then the, um, I guess it looks like they actually have the ability to do, let's say, um, Zemena Shipyards. Uh, their home world is Andoni, and their goal is planetary seizure. They want to gain control of Andoni, uh, difficulty of one, and basically kind of rates out what their goal is and what their progress is if they have like a timer on them, um, which is definitely kind of cool. And then their relationship is to the group. Uh, it also talks about their experience inside here and shows how the faction credits work. Uh, the assets tracker breaks down where each of these assets go, just to give you an idea of, of everything that is together. Um, then from there we have the goals, which is the basic goals out of the book as, as they originally were. Um, and then the tags here, which these kind of go into detail about what it is here. Um, so like Exchange Consulate, for example, when the faction successfully completes Peaceable Kingdom goal, they may roll 1d6 on a 4+, plus. they gain bonus experience point uh, once per turn. The faction may roll an extra d10 when defending against a wealth attack. So these are some different tags and things like that that, um, that will go with each faction which if we go back to the faction tracker, you can see some of those uh, tags right here. Um, so for example, planetary government, let's go back over the tags real quick. Planetary government is, let's see, right here. So the faction, its permission is required to buy or import the assets or those assets marked as needed, needing government permission. This tag can be acquired multiple times, once for each planet the faction controls. So if a faction controls multiple planets, it could be planetary government for multiple planets, which is definitely kind of cool. Um, I think what I'm going to do for now is actually finish filling out the uh, the bits and pieces here. I'm actually not going to put my factions inside here. Instead, I'm going to use a spreadsheet, which will be separate, um, and that'll just work out a little bit better for me. Uh, and let me delete that real quick here. But that gives you an idea of what we have ahead. Um, and I may not fill out absolutely everything inside here. We may add things as we go along. And I may just come up with, let's say, a dozen factions or something like that. Um, I don't necessarily even need all of my stars to have planets around them right away. Uh, I can always add more as we go along. Um, part of the daunting task of doing a sandbox is simply the fact that there's just so much 
out there that uh, you want to include or do and a lot of times it's better to kind of write as you go so what I may end up doing is starting the ship up in this cluster of stars up here and maybe all I really need to do is label these first stars right here 001, 02, 0, 1000, 2001, 2002, 2003, and 3001. That may be the first area that my my group adventures in just to kind of get them some ideas and I may end up like if players are interested in starting in a different area or doing something else we may just pick out some other planets and just kind of add things as we go um, there's also player turns which they've shown on swan song about how the player turns work um, Adam Koble has gone through them and I will be doing a similar thing where I whenever I do my GM turns I will be showing those on the channel as well to kind of give you guys an idea of what my factions are doing and how that's going to change the campaign so they get the full experience. I think Swanson did it right, so I'm going to emulate what they've done, of course. All right, so that's going to be it for this broadcast. Um, hopefully this helped out everybody who's looking at Stars Without Numbers and feeling like they, they want to give it a go. Uh, again, if you want to make it easy, there's also the sector generator which does most of the work for you and I am not even gonna lie I'm totally gonna steal a lot of this stuff because frankly it is much easier than me rolling up a bunch of stuff alright guys as always thanks for tuning in um, we we hope that you like share comment and subscribe um, tell your friends about it and if you are interested in playing uh, Endeavor with me on the tabletop RPG one shot group I am posting a um, a uh, recruitment post right now that has received some activity so I'm very glad to see that and even while filming this I've been getting posts and updates about their people interested in playing so if you are interested let me know there I will be picking out my players I've decided later tonight which is again the 30th of November so that way we can decide when the uh, the session zero is going to be so that we can develop characters and I can hopefully have enough of a universe put together for you guys to really play with. And I'm going to seek out some input from my players, so there may be a world that I haven't filled in that I may just go, Hey, uh, you know, uh, player one, what, what's, the, what's the feeling of this planet? What is it like? Is it, um, what's the language? What, are the, what do the people act like? What are their mannerisms? And kind of kind of use that and play with it. Uh, and then if the game keeps going long enough, we may even use another sector. Um, I'm completely open to that, which is why the Roll20 is so valuable, because I can turn around and go, okay, close up this sector. We're now in the new sector. Um, it'll definitely be worth it and a lot of fun. And I can't wait to see what players come up with so that we can explore and I can really try out the sandbox and, and roll with it and see what happens. That's pretty much all I have for us right now. Uh, thanks a lot for tuning in and all the support you guys give me.